It is not often that the, a Bible theme makes the front cover of Time magazine. <clears throat> but that is exactly what happened with the July 1, 2002 issue. The heading of the feature article as shown on the cover was The Bible and the Apocalypse. Why more Americans are reading and talking about the end of the world. Of course, it could be said that not only are Americans talking about the end of the world, Christians everywhere are caught up in this latest surge of interest in Bible prophecy. All Christians should applaud the fact that more people than ever are turning to the scriptures and especially to the study of the prophecies. But the question is, what interpretation are they placing on the prophecies? Time was referring to a feature article in this issue to the great interest that has recently been created in biblical apocalyptic prophecy with the publication of a series of books dealing with the last days. The first of this series of books, according to Time magazine's listing, was entitled Left Behind and dealt with the belief many Christians hold that there will soon be an unexpected secret rapture in which all those true believers will be spirited away to heaven. Hence the title left behind refers to those who are not believers who will literally be left behind on the earth. You see, you wake up in the morning and some members of your family have gone missing. So you ring up the police and say, well, what's happening? Some of my loved ones are missing. And they say, well, thousands, maybe millions are missing today. And it must be the secret rapture and we who are left behind are, are in trouble. Seven million copies of this particular book were printed. Undoubtedly, the terrorist attacks on America on September 11, 2001 helped to fuel interest in apocalyptic uh, prophecy. Altogether, there are 10 volumes in this series. They paint pictures of what is believed will happen on the earth. Each of these volumes has a run of millions, so that by the time Desecration, volume nine, was released on October 30, 2001, some 50 million books had been printed. The last two volumes were printed and released in 2004. These books have been authored by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins. In order to understand how futurists interpret Bible prophecy, for that is the format of interpretation used in these books, it will be helpful to first show, again, the biblical teaching of the 2,300 days which we have discussed in the previous lecture. Together with its subdivisions of 69 weeks and 70 weeks, and then to show later the interpretation given to some of these prophecies by those who follow the futuristic uh, interpretation of Bible prophecy. The written explanations that follow will highlight the differences and show the scripture how scripture does not support these views. So let's have a look at the chart. We've studied this in a previous lecture. And here we have the 2,300 days, starting with the date which we have established, 457 BC, going over to the end period, a date we have established as 1844. Subdivisions of this prophecy are found in chapter 9 of Daniel, the 70 weeks, 490 years, and the 69 weeks, 483 years, with the 70th week remaining between the end of the 69th week and the end of the 70th week, a period of seven years. 
And the Bible prophecy says that in the middle of this week, he, talking about Jesus, would cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And this he did by his crucifixion. And we have seen how the date for the baptism of Jesus, 1827, is correct. Three and a half years later, the date for the crucifixion is 1831. And the 70 weeks, 490 year period ends in AD 34 with the stoning of Stephen and the gospel going to the Gentiles. We have also shown in here the 1260 year prophecy, sometimes called the time times and half a time, time times and dividing of time, 42 months or 1260 days. These are all titles or names given to this period of time in Bible prophecy. Beginning in 538, when the Pope got power. The Pope was uh, hindered by his desire to control the ancient Mediterranean world by three of the ten divisions into which Rome broke up, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, who had adopted a form of Christianity known as Arianism, which denies the full divinity of Jesus. And when these three nations were eliminated, then we have the coming of the 1260-day um, period, which ended when General Berthier, a French general, took the Pope prisoner in, off to France, and he died in exile in Avion, in France, and papal power was broken. Many people thought that was the end of the papacy. Revelation 13 calls it the deadly wound, but it said the deadly wound would be healed and the revived papacy would have a part to play in the events of the last days over here. Now then, what do the futurists do? The futurists are those who interpret the, by these prophecies in a different way. Uh, they talk about a 69-week period. Here they have it. They don't, uh, they're, not very, they're very hazy about the dates here, but they've got a 69 period, 69 weeks period, uh, which they put the cross at the end of it instead of in the middle of the 70th week in here as it belongs. Um, but because they don't say too much about the dates here, we'll not say much more about it now. But then they ignore completely the 2,300 days. They don't make any reference to that. They say it's a nothing. It doesn't feature in their thinking at all. But the 70th week, they say, comes down here. And between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week, they have a great gap of 2,000 years, which is known as the gap theory. Nothing in the Bible suggests this. I'm just pointing out what these futurists say. But the 70th week is a period of time when they say a secret rapture will begin the period and the saints are all taken off to heaven. Then there comes a period in here where the saints in heaven... And this in here is becomes a time of tribulation. A seven-year period. A Middle East man takes control of the world. Some people thought that Saddam Hussein in Iraq was going to be the fulfillment of this interpretation. But of course, uh, no, he didn't, as we know. He was uh, executed. A Middle East man is going to take control of the world, probably through the United Nations, and he makes a treaty with the Jews. He makes this treaty with them, and favors them and allows them to start to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. Now you can just imagine what's going to happen when he, if he ever came to do that, because all the Muslims in the world would rise up in uh, re rebellion and civil war, international war, because the temple site is now hosting the Dome of the Rock, which is the second most important shrine of the Muslim religion. And they would have to demolish that to build a new Jewish temple. But they say that uh, for three and a half years they do that and then after three and a half years he changes his mind about the Jews. He cancels the covenant that he made with them and begins to persecute them and he becomes the 666 of the Antichrist power and he persecutes people in here, he persecutes the Jews and any Christians that were converted after the secret rapture. And this is called the time of tribulation and it lasts for 1260 literal days not prophetic days, a day for a year, which the Bible gives, and, uh, or the 42 months, uh, the prophetic time. 
And then, of course, the second coming marks the end of it. This is the interpretation of futurism. And uh, we will have a, a look at the, the history of where this doctrine began and uh, why it is so popular today. While there may be some variations with regard to some of the details, the general belief of most evangelical Christians today is that there will be one day a secret rapture in which all the righteous will be secretly taken to heaven, as I have explained, and those not ready will be left behind. About this time, a Middle Eastern man, an Arab man, will get control of the world. Usually, it is thought that he will do so through the United Nations organization, and then he will become a world dictator. It is believed by most evangelicals that the secret rapture marks the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. So you see the gap between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week, a gap of 2,000 or so more years. If uh, uh, this gap theory forms the basis foundation of what is known as the futuristic school of prophetic interpretation or futurism, one of the things that this world dictator will do is to make a treaty with the Jews, as I've explained, who are still regarded as God's chosen people. It is believed that they have been set aside during the Christian period, but will now be restored to God's favor in the last days. In this treaty, the new world dictator will allow the Jews to rebuild their temple and renew their blood sacrifices in Jerusalem. You see, the Jews don't have blood sacrifices today because they don't have control of the temple site. Once they get control of it and build a new temple, they then hopefully be able to renew their blood sacrifices again, which of course would be an indication that they reject the sacrifice that Jesus made years ago. This event will mark the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel 9, verse 24. After ruling the world for three and a half years, it is claimed that the world dictator will change his attitude to the Jews, cancel his treaty with them, and turn against them with a terrible persecution. This will be the time of tribulation and will last for the next three and a half years. The end of the time of tribulation will be at the end of the seven years of the 70th week. This period is regarded as the time times and dividing of times of Daniel 7.25, the time times and half a time of Daniel 12.7 and Revelation 12.14 and the 1260 days mentioned in Revelation 12.6 and the 42 months spoken about in Revelation 13.5. To accommodate this interpretation, it is claimed that now the 1260 days are not prophetic days of one day equaling to one year, but of one day equaling a literal day, or three and a half literal years. It can now be seen that uh, those who teach these theories use the dear year-day principle of Bible and prophetic interpretation for parts of this Bible prophecy, such as the 69 weeks we had at the beginning, and then they deny it for other parts of the same prophecy, which of course is, exposes their interpretation to be inconsistent. It is believed that the church will miss the tribulation because it is already in heaven. And they talk much about the church missing the tribulation because the saints have gone to heaven in the secret rapture. They do not pass through any tribulation on the earth here. Thus this individual Arab or Middle Eastern man becomes the Antichrist or the man of sin or the 666 of Bible prophecy. At the end of the seven-year period, Jesus will come to the earth in power and great glory and judge the wicked, including the Antichrist, who has persecuted the Jews. Then follows the millennium of Revelation 20, in which Christ reigns for a thousand years on earth, not in heaven, as the Bible indicates. Well, now let's look at a short history of prophetic interpretation. Prior to the Protestant Reformation, there were various schools of thought in the area of prophetic interpretation. However, during the days of Protestant Reformation, 
the reformers were virtually united in following the historicist school of interpretation, which pointed to the papal Rome as the power that fulfilled the specifications of the prophecies, that spoke about the little horn, the man of sin, the power represented as the 666 of Bible prophecy. Many Christians today are unaware of this fact. Perhaps that is why so many evangelicals today have so readily adopted other schools of thought. Evidence of support for historicism in church history can be seen in the volumes produced by Leroy Edwin Froome, full volume set known as the prophetic faith of our fathers, where he has gathered from the writings of uh, many ancient and Middle East, uh, Middle Ages uh, interpreters, evidence of the application of Bible prophecies about the Antichrist to the papacy, showing that the Protestant churches that came out of the Reformation were speaking with a united voice, identifying Rome, the Catholic Church, as the Antichrist power of Bible prophecy. From lists, from rather, lists some 250 expositors from various Protestant faiths, from Luther till the early 19th century, who followed the historicist method of interpretation, showing that it was almost unanimously believed by non-Catholic Christians. <clears throat> so telling were the accusations that the reformers made that thousands of people were leaving the Roman Catholic Church and joining the newly formed Protestant churches in order to stem this tide, the Council of Trent was called. This is probably the greatest council the Catholic Church ever held. Many people do not know that it lasted actually for 18 years. That's some council to go for 18 years. From 1545 to 1563, uh, they were not sitting in council for 18 years. They came together, discussed, discussed their problems, assigned uh, certain scholars to write papers on certain topics, and then they went back and the research was done, and scholars wrote their papers, they came back and they looked and presented the papers and discussed them and amended them and gave more assignments and went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for 18 years before they finally came up with their resolutions. One of the great issues, of course, well, there were several great issues of the Council of Trent. One was, what is authority? And some of the early bishops said, the, the Bible is the authority. It's God's word. And others said, well, but the teaching of the church is also equal in authority. And some might have even said even greater because Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter, so they say. And so they debated that topic. What is authority? They, we can't stand on the Bible and the Bible alone. That's what the Protestants are doing. And they're using the Bible against us. We have to take the church as at least equal authority, if not greater. And that was resolved when the Bishop of Rigo got up and made a speech in which he said, we have to take our stand on tradition, the teaching of the church, because the Bible teaches the seventh day Sabbath, but we all keep Sunday. All of you agree to keep Sunday on the authority of the church, not the Bible. And that run, won the day for tradition to be elevated, uh, to at least be equal, if not superior, to the Bible in the Council of Trent. Another issue they discussed was how are we saved? And uh, some said we are saved by, uh, by faith. Some said, no, we're saved by uh, works. We have to do works of righteousness. And the quarrel between works and faith, uh, law and grace, went on. And they said, we, we, we can't sound like Protestants who talk about by grace alone. Luther was saying, you know, sola fide is one of his platforms. And uh, so they came out with the doctrine of uh, merit and... Uh, uh, penance, and so on, and put emphasis on the works that people were to do. Another one was the interpretation or, or application of the Spanish Inquisition to persecute those who disagreed with Rome. But one of the great issues was, how are we going to interpret the prophecies, especially of Daniel and Revelation? 
2 Thessalonians 2, some of Matthew 24 perhaps, uh, we have to silence the Protestants. They are using these prophecies against us, pointing the finger at us and saying, we are the Antichrist power, we are the 666, we are the horn on the fourth beast of Daniel 7. We are the leopard-like beast in Revelation 13. That's what they're saying. And thousands of people are leaving us and joining them. We have to find an interpretation to put the finger on somebody else, not on us. And so they assigned two scholars to do research to come up with this alternative interpretation of the prophecies. One was a man called Alcazar, a Jesuit priest. And he went away and did research and came up with a theory known as Praetorism, which I'll talk about in a later lecture, which says briefly that uh, the prophecies are all fulfilled in the past before the Catholic Church came into being. It's, a, it's a Antiochus Epiphanes, or it's Nero, Emperor of Rome, who persecuted the Christians. That's not talking about us. Put all the prophecies as being fulfilled at all in history so it can't apply to us, they said. The other one was Rivera, who went away. He was another Jesuit priest, and he came up with the doctrine of futurism that we are discovering now. And he said, no, we are not the Antichrist power. We are not the little horn power. We're not the leopard beast of Revelation 13, because these prophecies all have to be fulfilled in the future, way down at the end of time. We are Christians. We're not the Antichrist. We are Christians. So they got this interpretation of a future Antichrist that was to come. Now, there are variations, as I said, some of the theories and finer points of the theory, but the basic platform is Antichrist has not yet come, it's coming in the future. And that took the heat off the Catholic Church. And the Council accepted both of these interpretations and offered them to the Protestant world. Now, it's interesting that uh, the Protestant world has accepted these two things. It was an attack on Protestantism, and it worked very well. Because in the, in the Protestant world, you've got a division. On one side, you have liberals who don't believe in miracles, try to explain all the miracles by natural law. And prophecy being a miracle, they said, no, no. It, the Bible writers were actually writing history when they talked about an Antichrist power. And Titus Epiphanes is in the past. Nero's in the past. And the people, of the book of Daniel was written at a time after these events were fulfilled and he pretended he was writing a prophecy. He forged Daniel's name to give it to some kind of authority. And I've discussed the question of the date of the book of Daniel in a previous lecture. And so you see the connection now between that lecture and what we're presenting in this lecture over the question of futurism. And the liberals adopted that theory that interpretation, that alibi, uh, more than the evangelicals, because the liberals don't believe in miracles like the evangelicals do. And prophecy being a miracle, they rejected it and it talked more for something in the past that was history. But the evangelicals do believe in miracles. And they are the ones that have swallowed line, hook and sinker, this interpretation of futurism. And today it is the evangelical Protestants who are promoting futurism not the Catholic Church. I went into a Catholic bookshop some years ago and looked up some of their catechisms and some of their books and I found very clearly the Catholic Church is taking its position more on praetorism, that it's all in the past. Antichrist is in the past. But the evangelical Protestants are the ones that have taken up the offer that the Jesuits gave them that Antichrist is still to come in the future, therefore it's not the Catholic Church. That is the issue that is being faced now by our Seventh-day Adventist evangelists when they go to preach the gospel. Because every evangelical Christian that you now meet, out there, wherever, most likely has been indoctrinated with futurism. From my experience as a pastor doing pastoral evangelistic work years ago, I experienced it. It was an issue that you have to take up because people are studying it and being taught it in evangelical Protestant churches today. All right. One of the basic teachings of futurism is that God has dealt with his followers 
throughout the history in different periods in different ways. This doctrine is known as dispensationalism. This teaching together with futurism was a characteristic of the Brethren churches. And uh, today, futurism has swept through the Brethren churches into the Pentecostal churches and is now in most evangelical Protestant churches around the world. Many Christians have a problem with dispensationalism and so should seriously consider if they can accept futurism as they usually linked together. They are usually linked together. Dispensationalism divides the history of the human race into seven periods of time with God dealing with human beings in different ways in different ages. This is not acceptable to us because God only has one way of saving men and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. These people that practice and teach dispensationalism uh, claim that from the time of uh, Moses to the time of Jesus, there was a dispensation of law and people saved by law keeping. But now we're under grace, so we don't need the law anymore. We don't need to keep the commandments anymore. Because the only commandment they really want to get rid of is the Sabbath commandment. They're quite happy with the one that says don't murder, don't steal, don't blaspheme, don't worship idols. They only reject the fourth commandment and they use the argument that the whole law is abolished to get rid of one commandment. Now, there are some problems with futurism, so let's have a look at them. A study of church history reveals that the idea of a gap theory between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week was not a position held before the Council of Trent. The Bible certainly does not suggest such an understanding of a 2,000 year gap between the end of the 69th week and the beginning of the 70th week. Rather, the 70th week follows on naturally and met its fulfillment in the death of Christ in the middle of that 70th week, as we saw previously in the chart. And we can see Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 to confirm that. Thus, the 69th week reaches to the baptism of Jesus rather than to his crucifixion, which we saw in the chart that the futurists have. It is at his baptism that Jesus officially became the Messiah or the Anointed One. As we read in Daniel 9.25, this understanding would not allow for the death of Christ to take place at the end of the 69th week. Thus by his death, Jesus caused the sacrifices to cease and to have any further significance because he became the fulfillment of those types and those shadows. That is why Christians today do not offer blood sacrifices in our worship services. Those who follow the futuristic interpretation claim as the proof text that their main text to prove their theories is Daniel 9.27. It refers to the future Antichrist. This is the main verse they use to support this interpretation. However, a close look at this text fails to support their view. The he of verse 27 refers to the Messiah and not to a future Antichrist. Here, one can be helped by looking at the grammar of the text. He is a singular masculine pronoun and must refer back to its antecedent, a noun with which it agrees in number and gender. That is the law of grammar. So when we look at Daniel 9.26, we consider, who is the he? In the preceding verse or so of this passage, Daniel 9, 26, we have three possible nouns to which the he can refer. One is people, that is a noun, but it is a plural noun. So it must be rejected as the antecedent because he is singular, you get it? He cannot refer back to people. If you're referring back to people, you would say them, not he. So rule out people. <clears throat> Futurists argue that the prince is the antecedent of the he. <clears throat> prince is a singular masculine noun, so it qualifies there. But uh, we must reject it because it is part of an adjectival phrase. The people of the prince. Of the prince is a phrase. Now, a phrase in English grammar is a series of words that has no verb in it. 
if it has a verb in it, it becomes a clause or a sentence. But a phrase is a group of words with no verb. So, of the prince does not have a verb. But of the prince is an adjective describing the noun prince, of the, uh, the, which qualifies rather the noun people. The people of the prince. It's qualifying the, the, uh, the prince. is qualifying he. Therefore, it cannot be an antecedent of the noun pronoun he. It is an adjective, and adjectives do not take antecedent pronouns. The only other one in the passage there is the Messiah, a singular masculine noun, and is the only possible antecedent to the pronoun he. So when it says he would confirm the covenant with many for one week, it's talking about the work Jesus would do. And how did he do that? <clears throat> for the 70th week, a covenant was confirmed with the people. What covenant was it? The covenant that God had made with the Jewish people to be his chosen people. For three and a half years, Jesus taught, confirmed the covenant, and then for three and a half years after his death, God still hoped they would repent, but they didn't. They stoned Stephen at the end of that period, AD 34, and therefore the covenant now lapsed, and the Jews are now no longer God's chosen people despite the fact that evangelical Christians today, following the futurist interpretation, claim that they still are. He confirmed the covenant with many for one week. A problem for everyone in studying and understanding prophecy is that one must be consistent in their methodology. Thus a weakness can be seen in the position taken by the left-behind authors. Since they use the day for a year principle for the 69 weeks and for the 70th week, but change it for a day for a day principle or literal time for the 1260 days and for the 42 months. Such a change of methodology creates real problems. To be consistent, one must use the same interpretation throughout. The same method should be used for all aspects of the prophecy. Either it's all literal time or it's all prophetic time. You can't pick and choose, make one prophetic and one literal in the middle of the same prophecy. While the Bible, especially the New Testament, speaks dozens of times of the second advent, it does not teach that there will be a secret rapture prior to that event, with the saints missing the tribulation of the last days. Rather, the Bible speaks about the saints going through the tribulation. Read Revelation 7 and verse 14. And the other question is asked, who are these people? And the answer is given. They came out of great tribulation. And it's talking about the redeemed of God. While God did choose the Jews in Old Testament times, <clears throat> the prophecy of Daniel 9.24 does set a time limit for their probation. Seventy weeks, it says, are determined or cut off for your people. And uh, when they rejected the Messiah, as I mentioned a few moments ago, God then rejected them as his spiritual special people. Instead, the New Testament clearly teaches that the true Israel of God today is a spiritual family, not a literal national family. You find that in Galatians 3, 28 and 29, and in Romans 7, uh, 9, 7 and 8, and also in Romans 2, 28 and 29. Those of the flesh are not counted as the seed, but those of the promise. Those who hold to the promises of God, the Christians today, are the true seed of Abraham. Then if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise. Whereas these evangelicals still want the Jews to be the heirs of the promise when the New Testament clearly says that all Christians are now the spiritual Israel and the heirs to God's promises. Another point that ought to be considered is that Jesus said in Matthew, what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 13, that no one knows the day or the hour of the second coming. However, if the second coming is to be seven years after a secret rapture, as soon as a secret rapture takes place, 
Everyone would know that the second coming is due in seven years' time. So the words of Jesus would be meaningless when he said, no man can know the time or the hour. Another consideration is the teaching that the Christian church is not the subject of Bible prophecy. Only the Jews are the subject of Bible prophecy. It is claimed that the prophecies deal with the Jewish nation, not with the Christian church. However, a study of Daniel reveals that his prophecies follow the pattern of repetition and enlargement. That's the format of Daniel's prophecies. Daniel 2 gives you a basic vision of the image, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Daniel 7 expands on that and introduces the idea of the little horn, the paper power. And other prophecies expand further into the book of Revelation. It expands some of the prophecies of Daniel. <clears throat> These, uh, pr this principle uh, is basic to our understanding of Bible truth. In Revelation, we read that uh, the, the, we read in Daniel rather that the book was not to be uh, was to be sealed, but the book of Revelation was not to be sealed. Daniel's book was sealed for a period of time and then opened later, but Revelation was not to be sealed. In fact, Revelation 22. Verse 10 says, the time is at hand. See also Revelation 1, 1 to 3, when it says that the events described in the book of Revelation would shortly come to pass. And it's talking, of course, about the Christian period. Therefore, it can be concluded that the period of the Christian church is very much the subject of Bible prophecy and not excluded, as some say. A study of the meaning of some Hebrew words used in the Old Testament can also be helpful. Daniel 9, verse 27 says, He shall confirm the covenant. We mentioned before that he here is Jesus who confirmed the covenant of salvation by his death on the cross. The Hebrew word for confirm is the word gibor, G-I-B-O-R, which translates in English as to make strong. That is a covenant that is already in existence would be strengthened and made certain, made strong. Futurists try to read into this text that a future Antichrist will make a new covenant with the Jews when he favours them. But the Hebrew does not allow that translation. Gibor means to make strong a covenant, not to make a new covenant. To make a new covenant, the Hebrew idiom is to actually cut a covenant. The Hebrew expression is kareth barith. And we find that in Haggai chapter 2, verse 5, and 2 Chronicles 7, verse 18, where a new covenant is made. And the translation of Kareth Barith is to cut a covenant. And where do they get that idea from, to cut a covenant? Well, it comes from the cultural way of making a covenant back in Old Testament times, especially in the time of Abraham even. In Genesis 15, we read when Abraham and God entered into a covenant together. God made this covenant with Abraham that Abraham was told to take an animal, cut it up into pieces, kill it, cut it up into pieces, and spread the pieces out on the ground, one line there and one line there, and then God came as a burning furnace and walked between those lines, those parts. This is the way they made a covenant back in the days of Abraham. They take an animal, kill it, cut them into pieces, make two lines, and then the participants would walk through that area between the two lines, signifying if I do not keep this covenant, this will be my fate. I can be cut up like this. In other words, I am staking my life on being faithful to this covenant. Get the meaning? I'm staking my life on this covenant. That's what God did with Abraham. He entered into this covenant in a cultural way so that he could understand it in his culture. And the expression is to cut a covenant. If God in Daniel is making a, foretelling a new covenant that is to be made by the Arab dictator with the Jews, he should have used the word kareth barith, not the word gibor. Because the word gibor refers to making strong, uh, confirming a covenant that's already in place. 
Jesus confirmed the covenant of salvation by his death on the cross. That is the fulfillment of the text, not some new covenant as some people try to imagine. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, we read that the resurrected saints and the living saints are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. In the teaching of futurism, these two groups are not linked together, as Scripture says, but experience their meeting of the Lord at different times. Those that go up to heaven during the secret rapture and those that are redeemed during the time of the tribulation. You see, they still believe that people can be saved even during the time of tribulation. I once listened to a tape recording of a lecture given by a gentleman from New Zealand who lectured down in Manly in Sydney. And he was teaching about this futurism doctrine. That was his uh, whole message, preaching this uh, interpretation. And he said, uh, if you become a Christian now, you will be raptured in the secret rapture. But if you don't become a Christian now, but you become a Christian after the secret rapture, during the time of the tribulation and so on, you can still go to heaven, but you go to heaven without your head. <laughs> I laughed when I heard that. I mean, the head is this, the seat of knowledge. I think when the head is no longer joined to the body, you're no longer alive. How you could be in heaven wandering around with no head, you wouldn't even know you were there. And people were swallowing this doctrine, line, hook and sinker. Believing it as Bible truth. The text that he quoted, of course, is the text that he found in the book of Revelation. That I saw the souls of those that were beheaded under the altar. Yes, people were beheaded, but what the verse is saying, I saw those who were beheaded they have now been resurrected and are in heaven with their heads, of course. But that thing, they're twisting the meaning and say, because they're beheaded, they've got no head, but they go to heaven without a head. And people believe. You know, it reminds me of that verse in the Bible that says, because people receive not the love of the truth, God sends them a strong delusion that they believe a lie. And so often that is the problem. Some years ago, one of my former students, Pastor Malcolm Bull, uh, helped uh, see me to see a, an insight into Daniel 9, 25 to 27. And I'll share it with you now on the screen some of the arrangements that he outlined to me, which I found to be very helpful. We have here in these three verses a format where Daniel is writing and he makes a statement about the Messiah and then a statement from history or about prophetic history what will happen another statement about the messiah followed by a statement from what would happen in history and a third statement about the messiah plus what would happen in history you get the pattern a statement about the messiah followed by a statement of prophecy of the future statement of the messiah prophecy of the future history messiah history let's have a look at them and see how, how it uh, helps our argument Verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. There's the 69 week prophecy for you. Then it says, The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. That's the historical statement, the history that would come, the prophecy dealing with future history. Chapter, uh, verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And then the historical statement. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Then we have the final verse, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant, or make strong the covenant with many for one week. That's the 70th week. And in the middle of that week, he would cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Jesus caused the sacrifices to cease by becoming the antitype of those sacrifices, the reality of them. They all pointed forward to his coming sacrifice. And when he made that sacrifice, animal sacrifices were no longer needed because the real sacrifice had come. Now comes a historical prophecy. He shall make it desolate even unto the consummation, and that shall be termed, shall be poured upon the desolate. The margin reading is... 
would be poured upon the desolator. That is, the power that desolates or tax God's people will be destroyed or punished. Here is God's promise that the Messiah will in the future destroy the power that attacks God's people. We who follow the historical method of prophetic interpretation find that there is solid support in Scripture for it. Those who follow the futuristic school have all the problems that I have outlined to you. That is the reason why we cannot accept it. It was an an attempt by the papacy to divert attention away from them, and unfortunately the Protestant world swallowed it line, hook and sinker. The Catholic Church sits back now, and the Protestant churches, as it were, preaching their doctrine, carrying the ball for them while they sit back and applaud. What a shame it is that uh, more people don't see the truth that it is in the Word of God, but we know that the devil is trying to confuse people because he knows their salvation may depend on the right choices they make, and he doesn't want any to be saved. Thank God we have a Savior that wants all of us to be saved. May God bless you. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now, should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.